Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for the first Cities on the Frontline session of the year. Happy New Year and welcome to all. My name is Malika Metadin. I am a young professional at the World Bank and I support the urban program in East Asia based in Singapore. And co-hosting with me today is Lorian from the Resilient Cities Network, who will introduce herself, the topic, and our panelists shortly. So just before we start, let me remind everyone of the intentions of the speaker series and the ground rules for our conversation today. The purpose of these global seminars is to have an open and honest learning conversation. The calls are not on the record, and we ask that you do not attribute any comments unless you have the person's express permission to do so, and we can help you to obtain this um, permission if you need it. We have about 200 registered participants for the call, so to facilitate the discussion, we ask that you write your questions with the help of the WebEx Q&A function, or you can put your questions in the chat. And please note that the recording of the session, as well as the PowerPoints for the presentations, will be posted online by next week. Lorian, over to you. Thank you so much, Malika. Um, well, welcome to our session on measuring vulnerability and building equitable resilience. As Malika mentioned, my name is Lauren Farrell, and I am the Regional Director for North America at the Resilient Cities Network. It's a, I've had the pleasure of working with both of our panelists on the Resilience for Communities program. And as a Regional Director in North America, I speak to many Chief Resilience Officers who share the same message with us over and over that they need to be able to define resilience in a quantitative way. They want to know how do they measure resilience so that they can do their, their work more effectively. Um, it's important for them to be able to have discussions about prioritizing projects when there's lots of com competition for, for uh, resources within cities. Um, and it's also important for being able to demonstrate impact in cities. So this is a really um, important project for us at the Resilient Cities Network that meets the needs of our CROs, as they've, they've, they've told us. Uh, we were fortunate to link up with David Nash at the Zed Zurich Foundation to create the Resilience for Communities program. And the Zed Zurich Foundation is an excellent partner because they had an established program centered on flood risk in rural areas, and they wanted to expand that program to include heat while also implementing in urban areas something that we know a lot about at the Resilient Cities Network. So it was also a very important bonus for us, having the opportunity to work with a strong network of practitioners in the Flood Alliance, who you're gonna hear more about uh, shortly from our panelists. And I'm gonna save all the more details um, for our speakers to expand upon those points further. So as I mentioned, our cities co-created this Resilience for Community program with the Zed Zurich Foundation. We're very interested in centering equity in, in our processes and also ensuring that there is an element of learning and scaling, three things that are not always important to funders. So this was very, very welcome. And also interested in, they were also interested in implementing solutions. And so you will hear about the Climate Measurement for Resilience tool and how it supports communities in designing solutions. There are five cities in North America that are participating in this work with us. In a minute, you're gonna meet them in a short um, intro video. But first, let me uh, tell you a bit more about our speakers. So first, we're gonna hear from David Nash, who I've been speaking about. Uh, David is the Climate Change and Partnerships Senior Manager at the Zed Zurich Foundation. Through 15 years in the corporate sector in the UK, he developed a keen business acumen much of, much of his early career was spent in facilitation and people roles, firstly in training and development, moving towards more externally facing roles in partnership and organizational development. In 2005, his focus shifted towards how corporates engaged with communities. He then spent the next eight years managing the India program from 2005 to 2013, and often playing double duty as the CEO at Chennai-based mental health charity, The Banyan. In 2013, David returned to the Zurich Insur Insurance Group in Switzerland and the Zurich Flood Resilience Program. This program is a multi-year global initiative aimed at enhancing community resilience to floods. Recently, this has been expanded with further work planned until at least 2024, demonstrating the long-term commitment 
to enhancing resilience at a global level. And I can say it is David's diverse experience and his ability to really see how to make space in corporate settings for the voices of communities to be heard that led to the design of the R4C program as we know it today. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Jordana Vasquez, who is a manager for climate resilience and equity at the Resilient Cities Network. And she's also the program lead on our Resilience for Communities program. In this role, Jordana engages, engages with program participants, including city staff, local community organizations, and other stakeholders to advance opportunities to identify and scale community-centric resilience solutions. Prior to her work at Resilient Cities Network, Jordana served as senior associate with a New York City nonprofit called Building Energy Exchange, known as BX, tackling climate issues linked to the built environment in support of the city and the state's ambitious climate action plans. Before BX, Jordana worked as a community development officer, uh, providing technical assistance and development, development aid for Hurricane Sandy's multifamily recovery and resilience efforts. So as you can see, we have we could not have found a more suitable person to lead this work in the field with us um, and to lead the R4C program. Jordana also graduated from Pratt Institute with a bachelor's in architecture and holds certifications from GBCI, Environmental Leadership Program, and the Global Leadership Human Impacts Institute. Now, before I hand the microphone over to our speakers, I would love to share a short video that will tee up the discussions nicely I will hopefully, hopefully demonstrate for you the energy and the excitement and the deep value that this project has presented for the cities involved. So with that, I will ask uh, Nelly if you wouldn't mind running the video. We didn't look at resilience from a climate perspective. We looked at resilience by a way of looking at race matters for a city that has been founded on race matters and, and really being ahead of its time. Oftentimes in our cities, we focus so much on the nuts and bolts, paving roads, the filling potholes, and we forget about the human aspect of how all these things are, are impacting. For us in New Orleans, it really is about uh, the city surviving. Um, we were almost wiped, wiped off the face of the map. A lot of these cities have implemented really incredible projects that's also helped to build resilience and responses to climate change. So Charleston has a lot to learn from some of the larger cities in this uh, resilience program. They're more diverse, and diversity can also be a, a management issue as you go forward and try to engage with the community. Especially the resilience measurement tool I think is going to be really valuable because it really puts in the hands of the communities a certain sense of autonomy in the sense of how they want to craft their resilient um, future. It is the culmination of many discussions with our partners at the Zed Zurich Foundation and Zurich North America who came to us with an idea that they wanted to be able to build community resilience. I am ever the optimist. I feel that as, as a society, we have the tools we need to, to improve the lives of even the most underserved in our, in our society. We can highlight new ways of doing the work, uh, highlight new ways of improving community resilience, and um, show that you can work together across barriers, across agencies, across disciplines, and that it's necessary to do so if we're actually ever going to achieve this ultimate goal. Okay, and now it is my pleasure to hand the microphone over to David Nash, who's going to speak to us about the R4C program and Zed Zurich's um, 
Foundation's involvement in getting us to this point today. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Laurie, and, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants uh, that have dialed into, uh, into this call. I'm just going to share my screen with you and I'll run through a few slides to illustrate what I'm going to be talking about um, um, behind it, uh, just to um, set the scene a little bit uh, about where we're at. So bear with me one second. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you can all see, uh, all see my screen uh, fine see at this great. particular point. Okay, so... Um, as Lorian said, we about 18 months ago, I suppose now, um, started having this conversation with the Resilient Cities Network uh, in the US uh, around uh, how we could work more effectively in cities using some of the experience that we'd had uh, from our work that we've been doing with the Flood Resilience Alliance uh, over the previous kind of eight or so years. Uh, and what I'd like to do is just kind of bring you through a process of of what it is we actually try and do on the ground, um, starting with a little bit of history um, about where where we where we kind of come from. Um, the Flood Resilience Alliance is something that uh, we uh, created alongside our partners um, originally with its roots back in 2013. Um, but the current incarnation of the partners, as you'll see from the logos up there, uh, span um, community uh, investment professionals, uh, community development professionals, sorry, humanitarian experts, um, institutes that are focused on um, research uh, and how to translate that research into practical action, uh, and as well as the uh, as Zurich Insurance Company bringing in its risk ex expertise. Uh, now, this combination of multi-sectoral partners uh, across very diverse uh, different kind of sectors does give us a huge opportunity of learning, um, of bringing together multiple perspectives to look at the challenges that we face. Uh, and the one big challenge we faced when we first launched our flood programme uh, was the uh, well, challenge that my boss first gave me on my first day working. They said, uh, you know, you're know, you going to come in and work with this flood resilience programme. Our aim is to build resilience for communities. How are we going to know we've done that? which is a very interesting challenge, bearing in mind that at the time, the, uh, the UNDP had just done a, uh, um, uh, an analysis of what was going on on the ground uh, and discovered that for every resilience professional, there was at least one resilience definition um, and often more, uh, and that there was very little uh, by way of practical, measurable systems. Um, there are plenty of frameworks, plenty of people saying that, you know, these are the kind of things that make up resilience. Uh, but there was nothing practical on the ground that you could point to to say, if you do this, you can measure this um, and be able to see that resilience was improving. In fact, I remember reading an article at the time which basically said, forget it, you can't measure resilience. It's too too conceptual as a, as a, as a topic. Um, so so you, there's, you're wasting your time thinking about it. Anyway, we, uh, we decided that we weren't going to waste our time, that we did need to think about it. And we did need to think about what resilience actually was so that we could put in place some idea of how we could tell whether a community had improved its resilience. Often the challenge with resilience is that it's a latent feature of a community. You don't know you've got it until you're suddenly hit by some kind of disaster of, of some description and you come through at the other side um, well. If you do, then the resilience was there. Um, until you see the disaster, you very often don't know that resilience is going to be in place. Uh, so how do you tell whether you've got resilience in the absence of an event? That was the challenge that we set out to try and uh, and um, uh, address. Uh, and we used all of the expertise that was set within the Flood Resilience Alliance. We looked at it from a risk management perspective by bringing in, in Zurich's expertise. We uh, uh, analysed the current situation uh, on the ground using our um, research partners, uh, and we brought a touch of practicality from those working directly with communities uh, to understand how it was that, that, that uh, a measurement system needed to work if it was going to work within communities. So what, did we, what, what, what process did we end up going with? Well, the first thing to talk about is what resilience is in the first place. Um, and uh, our starting point was trying to get an understanding, a definition of what we meant by resilience. Now, as I say, there's hundreds of these definitions about out there. Lots of them have got th features uh, in common with each other. They're not completely separate and completely different from each other. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of kind of um, concepts that are, are pulled together into people's definitions of resilience. Our research partners took a look at all of them, um, 
pull together every statement they could find about resilience uh, and tried to bring out from that the commonalities, the common features. And what they ended up with was, was the definition you see in front of you. Uh, our definition of resilience is the ability of a system, by which we mean a community largely in this situation, um, or a society, to pursue its social, ecological and economic development and growth objectives. So that's, in other words, the community evolving and developing and, and carrying on on its development path and becoming stronger as a community, whilst managing its disaster risk. So taking into account when it's looking at development, what disasters it's going to get hit by over time. So thinking about that in a longitudinal way rather than just as a snapshot in a way that mutually reinforces those things. So looking to see if you develop in the right way, that it adds resilience to the mixture, or if you build resilience in the right way, then you're going to help the community to develop. Um, the rest of that slide is some examples of what we mean by that, you know, in terms of goals and aspirations. It could be at an individual level, you have your own individual aspirations, right the way through to a community level, where a community has its own development goals and development aspirations. Often those are destroyed when you get hit by an event, such as a flood event, uh, or a heat wave or a bushfire. Um, and what the aim of resilience is to do is to recognize that you've, those development goals, those goals you have for yourself, if you've got resilience, are capable of being achieved. So that's where we started. We started with this idea of what resilience was. Um, and as you can probably tell, this is still a fluffy concept. Um, the, uh, the, the, the idea of somehow or other measuring this ability within the system um, when it's a latent ability, it hides before it's needed, um, is is, a, is an impossible task. You, I can understand the statement where uh, I was reading, you can't measure resilience, uh, because when you look at that statement, you can't. That's impossible to measure. So what we then did is say, OK, so if that's impossible to measure, how can we tell what makes up a resilient community or resilient system, um, which leads us to think about the characteristics of a resilient system. There's lots of characteristic models out there. Um, and the one that we kind of chose to use was this one, uh, largely because I think it's fairly straightforward as giving a series of characteristics. It's very similar to uh, the characteristics that have come out from the City Resilience Index uh, that Arup has developed as well. There are lots of similarities between these things. But if a, a community is resilient, it will have these characteristics. It will be well built, um, so it will be robust. It will have um, alternatives to the way in which it does things, so the backup systems uh, that provide it with redundancies in the system. Uh, it will be able to adapt as it goes, so using things in different ways depending on the circumstances. Uh, and it will be able to respond quickly. Um, all of those, those four R's of resilience actually came from an earthquake engineering model, um, looking at a built system. Uh, but if you strip the idea of a building out of it and start thinking of these in community terms, the thing works just as well um, in, in at a community setting. You, can, you can't measure those things either, by the way. Um, the, the characteristics, again, are things that manifest when you get hit by a problem. So we had to go another step further, which is to say, what provides this kind of characteristic to a community? And that's where we ended up talking about sources of resilience and distinguishing between where resilience comes from, i.e. the source of resilience, and what resilience manifests as, the outcome of resilience. Um, and our aim over the last 10 years has been to take these thinking, this thinking around where resilience comes from, these sources, uh, and to validate that they are a good proxy measure for outcomes. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes with, um, with our flood program and the communities we've worked with in the flood program uh, to, um, to try to understand that connection between the two. And our evidence is pointing to the fact that you can measure these sources of resilience as good proxies uh, for outcomes of resilience. Uh, and you can see the sources. The sources are there within the community. It's what the community knows. It's what the community has. It's how they use those things. Um, we pulled those together into another model, um, and this other model is uh, the five capitals of the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. Uh, the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework has been knocking around um, for a number of years, probably 20, um, if not more. Um, but it's a common and commonly understood way of looking at how a community is made up. Uh, the assets that the community have can fit all into this model. And so what we've done is created what we call the 5C4R model um, of resilience, which basically allows us to link sources of resilience with outcomes of resilience. 
Now that's all very good. Um, and we, we used that for seven or eight years in, in the kind of form it was in, um, but started to be asked questions about whether or not um, looking at it just through the lens of flood was good enough. Um, so we did some re more research, kind of understood uh, what um, um, the, the, the model was telling us. Uh, and basically you can replace the hazard by any other hazard in the model and it still would work. Um, so if it's a heat wave risk or if it's a fire risk, you might need to ask the question slightly differently, but you nevertheless can still measure it in the same kind of way. Um, and that led us to build a second model where we started to get a little bit more nuanced about what we meant by multiple hazards. And the multiple hazards um, basically took these sources and started to look at them differently. Some will be needed no matter what the hazard. Some will behave differently if it's a different hazard, but are fundamentally the same kind of thing. An early warning system, for example, uh, is a good example of that. An early warning system for flood is not the same as one for heat, but it's still an early warning system. Um, or it could be something that is only relevant to a particular hazard. Um, and by understanding that sources could be split in this kind of way, we're able to create a toolkit that enables us to analyze these things at the community level um, directly uh, and lead us to be able to put a measure on it. Uh, and putting a measure on that at the, at the start of a program, in the middle of a program, at the end of a program, can see a trend of data across a program and be able to measure whether there's an outcome. The huge benefit about this whole system, though, is not necessarily in just the measurement. That's what we set off to do. Um, but the other things that it does is it forces a conversation about resilience with communities because it's all participatory and at a community level. Uh, so it engages communities right from the outset in understanding their resilience. That in itself builds capacity. Uh, it also helps us to think about the interactions between different kinds of sources. Uh, so rather than just a um, um, an intervention where you don't know the unintended consequences, you can make interventions with a view to having specific um, intentional additional benefits coming from the interventions you make because you can make better decisions about your interventions. Uh, the programme itself in the flood programme um, has, has, has worked tremendously well uh, and now working with the Resilient Cities uh, Network in, uh, in the US uh, and with others as we spread that across the world. We're hoping that this multi-hazard framework provides us with the next step um, into, uh, into solving this conundrum. Of how do you work with resilience? I'll stop there, Lorian. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Um, and you just, you just spoke about the tool uh, and how it can be used as an entry point into speaking with communities in a very structured and um, and thoughtful way, and uh, and now I'm going to turn the mic over to Jordana Vasquez, who is going to speak a little bit about how that's been happening in the field um, through our R4C, R4C program. And Jordana, I will I will hand the floor to you, and you can queue up your video uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Larian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, bear with me while I'll share my screen, so give me one second. Hi, everyone. Uh, David spoke about the need to measure communities and the perception of resilience in the, sorry, to measure the resilience in communities and why we do the work that we do globally, locally, and also how the tool works in action. For the next few minutes, I want to dive a little bit into the implementation phase where we are with the program, but also give you a bit of a preview and a window into how the, the work looks in practice and also it looks on the ground. Uh, with that said, you're now a bit familiar with the definition of resilience and urban resilience. For us at Resilient Cities, it is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and also to thrive. And the reason I highlighted individuals and communities and meaningful engagement in this definition is because at the core of what we do and at the heart of the program, we are working with the most marginalized communities impacted by climate hazards, especially looking at the impacts of flooding and extreme heat. So not only do these communities bear the brunt of climate hazards, they're also suffering from great racial and social inequities. Inequities that are most often 
um, oftentimes reduce the community's abilities to not only react, but also recover in these times of stress. Um, and we're looking and talking about specifically aspects of the human side, the social side, the financial side, natural and uh, infrastructure. And so why do I mention all of this? It is because I want to, to set the tone a little bit into how the fees that we are working with came to be part of the program, why we decided to choose those action cities and, and, uh, and champion cities, as you're here in a minute. Um, and let's dive right into it. So for the selection of action cities, or in other words, our pilot cities, we were looking at cities that were interested in the, within the network and developing actions, developing projects that not only address the climate risk, but also add, uh, were interested in tackling the social and the racial inequities, as I mentioned before, as well as the underlying hazards of extreme heat and flooding. The cities that we selected were Houston and Boston, and per each of those cities, we were working with two communities. Another uh, characteristic that we're looking at were uh, strong chief resilient officers present, as well as a uh, presence of Zurich, North America. Now, as far as the champion cities, we're working with Charleston, Chicago, and New Orleans. These cities are cities that share very similar characteristics to the action cities. Uh, as far as similar challenges when it came to flooding and heat, um, opportunities as well, and gaps. Therefore, they are joining us on this journey to share best practices, resources, knowledge products, but mo most importantly, a fresh new perspective on how do we tackle a multi-layer problem while also receiving some of that technical assistance and introduction to the tool of how to measure resilience. So let's take a quick look at how this is looking on the ground now and where we are with the program. So as you can see, you're looking at the four different phases of R4C. You're looking first at the city engagement. This is where we're looking to get the buy-in from the cities, socialize the cities with the tool, and also introduce it to just local government, city council, and so on. The next phase is city diagnostics. And this is, the reason I'm excited about this one is because a lot of the work that we've been doing for the last six months to a year has really been about this phase here, city diagnostics. This is where we go into the communities, gather the data, collect the data, and conduct the community engagement activities for both for Houston and the planning for the city of Boston. Uh, the third phase that you're looking at is project. This is once we have the data collected, and we'll talk a little bit more about how this is looking in the ground. Once we have the data collected and identify what the gaps were, the challenges, um, the, the real issues on the ground, we identify from the, the data, we analyze the data and identify the projects that are gonna address the challenges on the ground. And then the last one you're looking at is at phase four. So this is when we come in and you know, think about how do we scale? So trainings, uh, perhaps a committee of practice, knowledge products and all their resources. So just again, a quick overview of the four phases of the program. And right now we are in phase two for Houston. Uh, we're almost done with data collection activities. And then for Boston, we're gonna be jumping right into that phase uh, pretty soon at the end of spring. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about the implementation phase of the methodology of CRMC, who we're working with, who are our key actors, and who are pretty much our rock stars in the program. So we work with community ambassadors. In other words, we call them local champions. These are our connections to the communities to the ground. We have been very lucky uh, to work with cities that were really well connected with the main actors, uh, as I mentioned before, the champions in the cities, people that are known throughout the community for advocating for the community, working with the community and for the community. So as you're seeing in this picture, our first community engagement to collect data uh, had took place at a food pantry. So as people were lining up, waiting for the food pantry to open their doors at eight o'clock, we were there at seven o'clock 
asking uh, the residents in the communities about their lived experiences on the ground during the event of a flood or extreme heat. So that's where you're looking there. The other part that I'll mention this is that we also work not only with the champions and the residents, with volunteers who are from the community, who have a stake at the community, know their community as well. Uh, Trinity Houston Gardens and A-Leaf in Houston, those are the two communities that we're working with. And the volunteers have been crucial and, and, and very critical to make sure that the program is successful in their communities. Okay, uh, the how we're doing this. So we are implementing uh, three main methods. So household surveys, as I mentioned before, in the context of Houston and Boston, we did not do, uh, do household service in the sense of going to the house per se, but we actually would go to places where folks were already gathering. So as you can see in this picture, we went to a Hong Kong market in the city of Houston in the community of Aleve, and we asked residents again about their lived experiences during a flood. Um, and it was extremely interesting. People were already at the place. We were able to uh, secure a translator, who you see in the photo, Mr. Andrew, who was able to be our connection to the ground and really gave that extra layer of trust that we needed to, to connect with some other communities, especially in the, in the uh, community of Aleve. The other two methods are focus groups discussions, which were a larger groups. And lastly, we also had uh, conversations with key informants. In other ways, they were subject matter experts. Okay, uh, and the last part about implementing the methodology is the why we do the work that we do. We're really interested in making sure that people develop a sense of ownership because if you have a sense of ownership, you have a sense of a stewardship. So, we want to make sure that the voices of the community are part of the planning and the design process, as well as what the interventions and the solutions are going to be. We wanna make sure that the voices are front and center and part of this whole process from beginning to end. Thank okay. you. And just a quick overview of what I explained. In the city of Houston, this is all the steps that we've able to accomplish from selecting the community, coming up with the community criteria, um, engaging the community residents, the local champions, the volunteers, and everyone um, within uh, the, the process of design, planning, and almost to the grading phase, which will be the last slide that I'll talk about. But it has been a great experience to really understand what the perception of community resilience has been in both uh, uh, A-Leave and also Trinity Houston Gardens. In the picture, you can see uh, one of our associates, Sada, she's conducting a household survey, asking questions to one of the residents about, I believe in that moment, most likely just, again, perception of how does she uh, think about like accessing education or accessing healthy foods or knowledge on first aid training. So those are the kind of questions that you were to expect during the household training. And lastly, it's uh, next steps are grading. So now that we are about to close that phase for data collection and gathering in Houston, the next phase is a pretty exciting one. We're going to be analyzing all the data collected through, through those different methods that I mentioned. And really highlight what were the opportunities, uh, most the challenges, the gaps, the critical issues that need more exploring by the community. We are going to be working with uh, two or three local champions identifying those communities and really think about how is this data going to inform the solutions that are going to be implemented in both of those communities. So stay tuned for more on the grading and the next phase um, to come. Now, I want to pass it over to my team. I don't need to share my screen anymore, but I do want you to take a look at a video that really just encompasses what we have been uh, doing in the city of Houston for the last few months and showcases the, the great work that has taken place there. Thank you. We are in Houston for our second community engagement. The community engagement that we are here doing in Houston starts with collecting data about how people perceive their resilience uh, to flooding and heat. And we have these little blue tablets that we're carrying around uh, with a series of, of questions that are designed to get at 
the different factors, components of people's lives that make them resilient. So the, the main objective for, for the program is to really understand from youth what are the gaps and challenges that you're facing in training to Houston Gardens. I believe our community can have the same thing that every other community can have. We feel like we've been left out here. People in the neighborhood are very, very resilient, but are we getting the community people involved? It's been five years with Harvey. I was debating either the bank taking away my home or rebuilding it. So with five children and my husband only working, you know, it comes days when you don't sleep. We're collecting this information and asking you these questions because we want you to be able to inform the interventions or the solutions that are going to be implemented in training to use environments. Thank you so much, um, David and Jordana. Those were really um, engaging presentations and um, especially the videos. Uh, it really, really um, shows us exactly how the implementation goes. Thank you so much for introducing the methodology and the importance of measuring vulnerability through established metrics. Um, I want to open up the floor for questions. Um, and I'll give everyone a minute or two to think about some questions, but I can start. We do have one question for David. Um, so what prompted Zurich to create the tool? And could you just tell us a little bit more about how um, you measure community resilience through the CRNC? Sure, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, so as, as I think I said in my presentation, the the, the the drive behind trying to create the tool was the fact that we um, were making these statements like we want to improve communities resilience, uh, but had literally no idea how to measure that. Um, and when we looked around to try and uh, you know, pick up a, a bespoke measurement approach uh, that we could just implement, uh, just add to what we were doing, um, it turns out that there wasn't one. Um, there, that, uh, there's lots of uh, talk around the fact you can't measure resilience at all because it's too nebulous, it's too kind of conceptual as an idea uh, to be able to measure it. Uh, so we, we decided that actually there are probably ways in which we can understand resilience that you can measure. So we set off on that journey to try and create something. And uh, over the last eight or so, eight to ten years, we've we've kind of built this thing um, um, as a toolkit to try and understand how resilience improves um, within the community. So, you know, where it starts from and how it, how it gets better. Um, and the way, in which the, the way in which the tool works, basically it says that a community's resilience um, is dependent upon the way that it um, builds, maintains and uses all of its assets. Um, and the community has many assets. It, it, it's got, you know, the, the human-centered assets of its knowledge, its, its uh, skill levels, all of that. Um, the way in which it's organized and the way in which people look after each other and the social connections, uh, as well as the things like built infrastructure and, uh, and the natural environment and, and the financing pieces as well. So all of those kind of asset classes, if you like, uh, that sit within a community. Um, are the things that will provide you with resilience you know if they're good if they're in good shape and they're they're used in the right kind of way when you get hit by a flood so you know they, they're designed to be hit by a flood and to absorb it then you won't be having a problem um, so you will be resilient in that sort of way so our, our aim was to try and find ways in which we could quantify that now from a from a Zurich point of view one of the things that uh, within our within our um, underwriting teams we have a function which is called risk engineering and risk engineering basically works with corporate clients, um, goes out to their facilities um, and assesses their facilities uh, for certain uh, risk factors. So if they're looking at fire, they look to see whether or not they've got fire alarms, whether they've got places where, you know, there's a huge amount of combustible materials or whatever it is. Um, all of these risk factors 
they can then grade and decide whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they could be improved or not. Um, and as a result of that, have a, a number attached to them, which gives the customer we're dealing with a risk rating, a score, if you like, uh, along with ideas for how they could improve that score, um, which is our risk improvement plans. Uh, and if you think about that from a resilience point of view, it's exactly what we're trying to do with resilience. We're going into a community, looking at all those things that could make up resilience, seeing whether they're good or bad or indifferent, putting a score to that, and then thinking, so what do we do to improve that situation? Now, the benefit of us taking a whole, um, all of these assets at the same time is that we look at the unintended consequences of action as well as the intended ones. So it's all about multi-benefit approaches, doing something that has uh, multiple impacts in different spaces, but doing that deliberately. You know, that, that actually answered the next follow-on question that I was going to ask about how <laughs> cities and local governments can use this information. So excellent answer there. Um, Lorian, do you want to take a question? Sure, thanks, Kalika. Um, David, I really I really enjoyed listening to you talk about the 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 um, beginning or the idea behind the tool because it really um, starts with the premise that communities are valuable, they have value. And there's something about communities that you can't always quite put your finger on, but there's resilience there. And you're getting at trying to understand that. And as you talk, you say the word assets. I found that very interesting because I never really thought about them in that way before, but that's exactly what they are. Um, and, and so that leads to another question that I'm gonna pose to Jordana before you even get to use the tool in these communities, you have to select the communities. And I'm wondering if you could expand or talk a bit more about how you worked with the cities to select your communities, um, the two communities, Trinity Houston Gardens and Ailey in Houston. Um, I imagine that there are many, many communities in need. So what was the process to help the cities choose those two communities? Absolutely. So we have uh, two different approaches. So for the city of Houston, we at our cities came up with a community selection criteria that really helped them visualize in a matrix um, an outline of all the different shocks and stresses that you can think of uh, that a community is going, it's, it's facing. So from anything from social inequities, racial inequities, to how prepared they are when it comes to uh, like the an, an aftermath of a storm to how they face their, their uh, extreme heat uh, hazards as well. And we laid all of those down and um, asked the community and asked the, the program team to really rank in that order in an order which ones were their priorities. So they had about four to five different communities that they had pre-identify with similar issues when it comes to extreme heat and flood, and as well as like the social and the racial inequities that I mentioned before. And it really came to two different aspects that were at the top of the list. One of them was how much work has taken place in a community, meaning can this community really benefit for an extra layer of resources and technical assistance to measure resilience? Or is this community has already been identified previously? Are we able to gather data that has been already either collected or, or, or found within, within the city and from the community? So at the end of the day, we decided to move forward with A-Leaf and Trade to Houston Gardens because they not only had part of the data, but also we had a really strong connection to the community in, in both areas. We also had a really strong connection to uh, the local champions that were that are really the enablers of for us to come in and ask the questions that we do. So local champions, um, the hazards that I mentioned, extreme heat and flooding, racial, social, and um, I'm thinking one last one, one last one. Yeah, just a a genuine interest in, in really investing in these communities that have been asking for it. Great, thank you, Jordana. Um, over to you, Malika. Thank you. I mean, Jordana, I was just going to ask a follow-up question, if you don't mind. It's a question from the chat, and it's really asking about the insights that you gained from the survey. Were there any um, needs that were expressed that you didn't in you didn't anticipate? Any surprising ideas that came up? Uh, yes, actually. So 
for both communities in the, the city of Houston, we had really strong leaders. We had uh, a woman named Barbara and the other woman named Huey who have been pillars in both communities for the last 30 years and have been really pushing forward for anything related to uh, the creation of parks, um, you know, mutual aids and different programs. And what I discover in the rest of my team through all the different uh, community activity engagement is that there is a clear need of the passing of the torch to a new generation. So both of the residents uh, spoke highly of the team that they work with, but they've been doing this for 30 years. They're ready to have some like, fresh blood in the group and just a new fresh perspective of the younger generations to take part in you know, the advocacy, the community engagement, and also just making sure that if they are no longer to be in the position that they are as local champions, there is a, a whole a series of, of younger leaders who are trained to do the work that they're doing, carrying on the work that they're doing. So that was a big, big need for both of them. Thank you for that. Lauren, do you want to take the next question? Sure. I see some some chats happening, and I'm wondering if we could. It's a it's a very interesting question. So I'm wondering if we could bring it out into the conversation, um, David, about how do you measure or adult technical and so somewhat intangible. Yeah, great, a, a, a great question uh, that, that I noticed um, that, uh, that Dario you're dealing with that through the model. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question that Dario has posed uh, and, and and understandable as well. I, I think the short answer is we don't. Um, we don't compare uh, the, uh, the the quality of the asset in uh, in human terms. So the, the way in which uh, the, the the community has um, knowledge or, or skills. Um, but what we do is look to see where they have knowledge. Um, where they have skills and whether or not there are elements of the other assets that they've got uh, that they could use or harness that knowledge to strengthen or vice versa. If there are strong points within the community because of the way in which they use the um, the natural environment, for example, uh, then we look to try and see how they're using that natural environment, where the strength lies, to see whether or not there are uh, education programs that we can use to um, um, capitalize on that strength and to, to build on that strength. Uh, the, the way in which the, the tool uh, sets up is to recognize this community as a system. Uh, so you pull on one lever and many other levers start to move at the same time uh, within these systems. Um, so our, our, our aim with the structure of the tool is to help you understand, or the approach, should I say, is to help you understand where those links are so that if you do start pulling on one because you choose one kind of intervention, then you know where else it's going to impact. You know where else you can have a benefit. Um, and so you can be deliberate about that. You can start thinking, if I did this, then I would be able to overcome the weakness over here, here and here. Um, whereas if I didn't do that, if I just focused on one of the weaknesses, all I'm doing is addressing that weakness. So it really is intentional to try and uh, understand how these things move together. I think a bit more like a Rubik's Cube than I think about it as a as a series of assets to compare with each other. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a, a, a wholly red side. So we've got to twist it this way and twist it that way to try and find the things that all line up together to go. And that's the solution we should implement. It's a bit of an art and a science at the same time. Completely an art. <laughs> it's, it's kind of got scientific once... behind it. Right. I recall you saying once that some of the solutions are in the intersections, you know, those un, those um, those small, tiny crevices between <laughs> the connections. Um, and you have to go looking deep in there and really try to analyze the data. Um, Nick, if you'll indulge me while I have David off mute, I want to just pose one other quick question, which I think perhaps is um, the answer will come from your work with the Flood Alliance. In, in rural areas, because we haven't dove into this in North America yet. Um, but the question is, do you have projects in slums or informal settlements where you can share some learnings from? 
Um, but I think that, I think the short answer is uh, not a huge amount of experience, um, because largely where 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 the flood program has been operating, it's been operating in, in countries like you know Philippines and Nepal and Indonesia and uh, Vietnam and so on. Um, on on uh, uh, from the, from the Asian perspective, um, similarly in Peru, in Bolivia, in um, uh, in Mexico. Uh, all of which has been centred around rural communities, or largely around rural communities. We have started to do some work in Manila, um, in the Philippines, uh, and that's um, uh, almost certainly involves informal settlements of some description, uh, because you know major major cities, particularly in Asia, where you've got major mega cities, um, huge amounts of, of vulnerability sit uh, in places uh, that are informal settlements. Um, and so the the kind of the work we end up doing with that. Um, uh, is um, is less easy to deal with than those that are in more formalised settlements because the fun the problems that the, the communities face in those places are, are much more fundamental. You know, land rights, for example, the ability to be able to stay, the accessibility of services, uh, to be able to survive in in those communities in the first place, uh, plus their then tenuous hold on um, income uh, and the ability to be able to um, uh, survive, uh, uh, kind of pushes the issue of uh, things like floods and heats to the back of the mind. So it's it's difficult to get us to focus on on particular problems. But I think once you start to understand that development and resilience are parts of the same coin, then you can start to see how you can think about how structuring better access to services, for example, helps to make you more resilient in the face of floods. So what services do you need in those spaces? Uh, is it better support water supplies, for example? Um, how do you make sure that you achieve those? So I suspect that some of the some of the kind of the solutions that will come out of that work in places like Manila um, will will focus in um, a lot on the kind of fundamentals uh, of how how some communities work. Great insights, and so the the learnings are transferable. Essentially, even yes, if we don't have absolutely. those one to one um, um, experiences. Yes, thank you, Malika. Over to you. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. And thanks, everyone. Lots of interesting questions. I'm sorry we're running out of time, but I will take one last question to Jordana. Um, so I know you talked about the power of individuals to respond. So the question is um, how people from the community can inform the solutions to be implemented, especially when they're not really experts. So what are the kind of um, hints and what sort of information do you expect to obtain from them? And then I'll also pose the last question about what the community or what, what is left behind with the community. So how, how do you actually build their reserve as individuals? Thank you, Malika. So um, I guess I'll start with saying that I do consider community residents, um, the community itself as subject matter experts. I do believe that if you lived in a community for an extended period of time and have had experiences with the hazards that I mentioned, extreme heat and flooding, the insights that you can talk to me about, the experience of being in on the ground. Uh, in most cases, we had uh, families that had to stay when there were you know, really bad storms and high levels of flooding because they had nowhere to go. So the insights that we're, we're getting from the community are insights from people who have experienced, who have had lived experiences on the ground during this uh, different hazard. So how can they um, inform? So not only, again, as I mentioned before, that they had that experience on the ground, they know what works best for them. So the community at the end of the day, they know best. They know their community, they know their needs, they know their gaps, they know that if there is a heavy flood, the access to education is limited. They know that there, if there is extreme heat, some cases, some of the workers, as I mentioned before, marginalized communities are not able to perform their, their job duties. So these are all very valuable data. Uh, in other words, valuable information that we're able to gather from the, the, the community on the ground. Now, when it comes to thinking, how do we address the solutions? A lot of them already have ideas. A lot of them, of the community residents, already know what works best for them. They know that they need a new, um, let's say, uh, they, knew, they know that they need more access to healthier uh, foods. They know that they need more access to 
uh, better resources. They know that there are gaps when it comes to training for first aid. So these are valuable insights that are really going to help us understand what it is that the community is prioritizing, what is it that the community needs, but most importantly, what is it that the community wants. So again, they are my experts under my eyes because they've lived it they, and they know exactly what they need. Trust me, they do. Perfect. And while I still have you with the mic um, unmuted, one last question about how these outcomes are integrated into local government actions and mitigation plans. So really forward looking. I know you talked about the phasing, but it'd be good to understand how we take this forward. So how is integrated in the local government? So the government of Houston early on had a list of pre-identified uh, projects that the community had voiced in the uh, in the past of like needs that they had that were not able to either reprioritize. Oh, sorry, they, they were not able to prioritize for either a lack of funding or a lack of resources. So the the data that we're collecting is really going to help the program teams to do that to not only prioritize to inform the practices, also to have a defensible argument and back up why are we doing some of the projects that we're doing. So again, um, the, per, the process is making sure that the data informs the interventions. The local government, in this case, the city of Houston, has had some idea and some experience on their ground identifying those challenges before. So they have some sort of ideas of what we can do. Uh, but we, for sure, would not move forward with any sort of intervention or solution that is not either backed up by the data that we were able to collect and also doesn't have the buy-in of the community. Because if it doesn't have the buy-in of the community, people don't feel ownership, they don't feel storership, and therefore it would not be sustainable. Very much. That was a really great answer. And, and thank you to both of you for answering these questions so well. I will hand over to Lorian now to wrap up. Well, that hour went by very fast. Um, thank you so much for your really um, engaging presentations and for sharing your work with us. I hope that we can bring you back in a future date to talk more about the next phase of the project um, where you have co-designed solutions with the communities and, and really put some, um, some work in place to help build community resilience. Um, that will be exciting to hear more about in the future. So thank you again to David Nash and Jordana Vasquez. Um, I want to um, thank our, our session organizers as well, Ada Rusto and Malcolm Robinson Campbell. And thank Malika, my lovely co-host. It's been a pleasure to, to work with you this morning. Um, the next Cities on the Frontline session will be scheduled on um, in the later part of February. So stay tuned to our website for session topics and timing for that one. I do apologize to those of you who posted questions in the chat and we ran out of time and we didn't get to them, but we do appreciate your engagement and your thoughtful questions. Uh, feel free to reach out to the speakers um, after the today's session if you want to discuss the program more. Um, thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our Cities on the Frontline session. Take good care and enjoy the rest of your mornings, afternoons, and evenings. Goodbye.